Chris, I hope you're having a great Wednesday. Welcome back inside the game in T-Town. Oh, I'm doing well. Hope you're doing well uh, also. No doubt. No doubt. I, I want to spend a lot of time uh, mm-hmm. kind of recapping a little bit just for a couple of minutes. What did you see in this Alabama-LSU game? Well, a, a dominant football team, a dominant performance. Um, was impressed on um, – a lot of levels. Uh, I thought the quarterback play was good. I thought he faced some pressure, some some um, some blitz pressure. Uh, we talked last week about how LSU's front is not good enough to get base pressure that they would have to bring um, added pressure. I thought he handled that pretty well. I thought that um, I thought he handled it real well. Actually, at times uh, it got to him a little bit, um, but. For the most part, he handled it well, protected the football, had the one pick that amounted to a punt. Um, it, it, you know, I thought the offensive line blocked LSU's front very well. You know, we talked. I know I know you've mentioned it, and you mentioned that some folks there had some concerns about that Alabama offensive line and run blocking. And, you know, all I can tell you is what I see inside the film. And, and this offensive line is – It's not good. It's really good. It's great offensive line by Alabama. I mean, the tackles are outstanding in pass protection, but they can run block. And when when they're committed to run blocking, they can do it, do it better. Uh, And I've mentioned before, when you pass that a whole lot, it takes you out of your run block rhythm. I don't think people relate to offensive lineman rhythm like they do quarterbacks or skill position, but that is um, a reality. And I thought they were great. Defensively, (laughs) man. You know, so much for, you know, people questioning the defense. So this is not a really good LSU offense. But I can tell you that um, they could not, LSU could not block three-man pressures of Alabama. I've said it all along that uh, Quinnen Williams is, uh, to this point, the best-graded defensive player in the country that I've seen. I thought he had perhaps his best game Saturday. They were dominant. They, they controlled the line of scrimmage both ways. Um, LSU really couldn't find many options in the passing game. Uh, they couldn't cut them at the line of scrimmage. They they couldn't get the ball out quick because Bama was prepared for that and got their hands in the passing lanes, a number of tips. They couldn't get any rhythm. And, you know, it was a dominant performance by Alabama. It was, um, you know, maybe not as many points as people had you are used to seeing out of Alabama. It really, I mean, they could have scored more points, um, and I thought they did a really good job of compressing the game and shortening the game. And uh, it was as dominant a performance as they've done all year long, considering, um, you know, where it is and whatnot. And by the way, I mean, I keep telling the folks here in Louisiana, it, it, we're, it, we're going to hear any more. I mean, I, I'm listen. I'm old, Ryan. Okay, I'm old enough to know this, but I mean, the whole thing about. You know, Bama and Tiger Stadium. I, I spent my childhood in Tiger Stadium. I mean, I saw Alabama for from 1969 to 2000. They never lost a game. I coached against Ray Perkins' Alabama team that they came back with Mike Shula. You may remember that. I don't know, Ryan, if, if you do or not, but they came back and tied us. They haven't. They haven't. They didn't lose a game until Nick Saban was coaching at LSU. So the whole it was a great atmosphere, tough, no doubt, but. You know, this Alabama team is a machine, and they don't let the events like that. You have to have a great football team, and you have to have a quarterback that plays great or a great quarterback to have a shot against Alabama. We are talking to Chris Landry. You can join all those 32 NFL teams, 78 major college football programs to become members of LandryFootball.com. You get in all the latest inside information from a guy, the college and NFL teams and programs turn to as a consultant on coaching and scouting magazine uh, matters. For less than a magazine subscription, you can get the film room breakdowns, recruiting, college football draft, NFL coaching searches matters. Check it out, LandryFootball.com today for our best season membership package ever. Membership options include monthly, three, six, nine months, or yearly. Get access to insights of a veteran coach, a scout, an administrator. All you have to do is tell them that you heard it right here on the game on Tide 102.9, LandryFootball.com. Chris, uh, going back to this committee just for a couple of minutes of this college football playoff ranking, mm-hmm. LSU at number seven, is that respect for LSU? But obviously a lot of respect for Alabama if they're not going to drop them very far. It is. I, I, I don't. To me, <clears throat> you know, I, they've got a tough job, and, and 
they deal with a lot of the analytics and I listen, I have access to the analytics as well. I Ryan, I as you know, I, I do the work by film and to me there's such a huge gap. I think there's Alabama and then there's a gap and then there's Clemson and then there's a really big gap and then you know, there's some good teams, and I would say that Michigan and Notre Dame and Georgia and to some degree Oklahoma, but there, there's just such a huge gap that I've said it before. You can take three or four and flip them to 13 and 14, and you're, on a given week you got pretty much the same thing, maybe with different records, different degrees of, of who they played and whatnot, when they played injuries and whatnot. I don't think LSU is the seventh best team in the country. I didn't think they were the seventh best team in the country going in last week. I don't think they are, but you know, I don't. I, I don't know that that there's really anybody that's close to Alabama, with the possible exception of Clemson. And I'm not quite even. I'm not quite sure about that. I do think it's a healthy respect for the fact that they've beaten some teams that were at least perceived to be good. I don't think Miami's very good. I think Auburn is not that good. The Georgia win was an eye-opener for uh, people on the committee. They beat Georgia, and Georgia's gotten better. See, I look at how a team, because a team either gets better or gets worse. I mean, they never stay the same. And so Georgia's corrected a lot of the mistakes that they made against LSU. They had four turnovers. Georgia's better than LSU. They weren't when they played them, but you have to respect the fact that LSU beat them, and I think they're getting a lot of respect for that. Do I think that West Virginia would beat LSU? Probably but it's not a whole lot of difference either way. West Virginia is not nearly as good defensively as LSU, much better offensively. Um, I think it is a lot of respect for what LSU did and probably the ultimate respect that if you get beat by Alabama, it's pretty much expected. Chris, when you when you look at this Alabama football team, l- let me ask you about special teams. How much of that is a concern for you? Because there's three phases of the game. We talk about it, offense, defense, Special teams has uh, been an Achilles heel for Alabama, even though this team is quality. uh, Do you see that being a problem as they make this playoff run? Yeah, here's the thing that, you know, as a coach and as a scout, when you break down tape, you're not sitting there saying, oh, we won the game, it doesn't matter. That's what fans do. That's what fans and media do. That's that's not what we do. The special teams play is, is not very good. I mean, it's just not as nearly as good as it's capable of being and certainly not up to their standards. Is it going to affect them in losing a game? Doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like anybody's going to be close. But the point is, is if you want to be on point on all three phases, um, there's something there that's missing. And I don't know, Nick Nick has told me in, in that they are really good in practice. I mean, they they do a really good job. The kick team, I mean, they, they just don't take it to the practice field. I, I don't know why. I think that – you know, it's one thing, one snap, one thing, the other. It's a bad snap. It's a bad hold. It's a it's a bad kick. You know, rushing the kick. I mean, I think you have some different things um, that are going on situationally in the game, and I'm not quite sure why. I think uh, maybe it's a little bit mental, but it is something that it's only going to affect them in a close game, which we've not seen to this point. But if, if you're kind of breaking it now, and I can tell you this, that Nick is aware of it, he's concerned about it, but he's not going to sit there – you know, if you're wondering why he's not, you know, belly aching about it, which he normally does that, because he knows that's kind of, you know, in his special team's mind. And, and he's the type that when they're struggling, he tries to build them up. And when, when you're doing really good, then he tries to bring them down to earth. That's his coaching philosophy. But I can tell you that it's, it's just not what it should be. And I, I can't really give the answer why. I really don't. Now, I don't think the – I think the return units and I think how they progress to the ball, I I think there's – I've seen a few mistakes, but it, it's it's still a pretty good unit. But the kicking game and making field goals, I mean, look, it, it, it practically cost them a national championship last year, and they bailed it out, and people tend to forget those things in a win. But in a close game, it could definitely be costly. We're talking to Chris Landry, LandryFootball.com. Uh, not to look ahead, Nick Saban would, would kill us, but uh, he's on the practice field, and hopefully he doesn't have the uh, access to the podcast here on Tide1029.com. Uh, when you look at Alabama and Georgia, if you were kind of giving us a little early thoughts, because now we know those two teams will meet and uh, they'll try to prevent one another from going to the college football playoffs, 
Uh, do you think Georgia is the team that they were last year, and could you see them uh, putting a roadblock in front of this historic season here in Tuscaloosa? I, I do do not think Georgia – first of all, Georgia's improved since the, the uh, LSU game. Uh, they're not the same team as last year. They're, they're not as good, and Alabama's better. So I think there's there's a bigger gap than last year, quite frankly. Um, I still think defensively uh, they're they're getting. I thought they did a good job against Kentucky, but it's one thing against a team that didn't have much much in the way of uh, a passing attack. Um, to, to gang up against the run. I, I think that they're still vulnerable on defense to some degree defending the run. I think they're running the football better. Uh, I think that they're – I think they do a really good job coaching, um, you know, in, in putting together game plans and making adjustments. So when they, they have a four series or half, they can adjust to it well. But I don't see this team being a, a great team. I think it's um, – it would be the toughest – matchup left for Alabama before the playoffs, but I don't see them beating Alabama. The only thing at this point that would derail Alabama is injuries at the quarterback position. Um, that would be the only thing. Um, I, I would even say that, that Mississippi State's defensive front is you know, going to be a little bit of a challenge just in that prism, but overall they don't have as much offense. I think Georgia has a little bit more balance, and as we look ahead, um, I think there'll be a lot of emotion. I think there'll be an, an aggressive game plan that they'll have against Bama. They're going to take some chances, so Bama's going to have to be prepared for it. But if Bama's healthy at quarterback, um, it's going it, to it's going it's going to take Alabama to have a lot of mistakes uh, and turnovers to be the equalizer for Georgia to have a shot in my view. Chris, did you think, because you, you've always been high on this team, we can go back and listen to interviews that you and I were talking about in May and June. Uh, have they exceeded your expectations? Yeah, because, you know, when you asked me all the questions in the summer sure. about Tua, the, the questions were, look, I think the kid's really good. The young man's really good. I've seen him in practice. I've seen what he can do. But, you know, I, I there's still you got to see it. You know, everybody wants to predict everything, and that's why the, the preseason predictions that Miami is this good or this, this whatever, it is, Auburn is, you don't know until you get on the field. And to see him play like he has, I mean, I could have told you that I think two is going to play well. I did. But to say that this guy was going to be hands down the Heisman Trophy winner, to be playing as good as anybody I've seen in a long time, no way did I think it was going to be this good. I mean, this is – this is um, it's every time I look at tape, it's, it's – got to tell you, it's, it's, it's kind of like watching some great quarterbacks at the NFL level, or Drew Brees, for example, and how they, they take away defenses. And, you know, I, I know I talked with Randa about it before the game, and, you know, they thought that he made a lot of pre-snap reads, and he does, but he'll come off of it pretty quickly. His anticipatory skills, unbelievable. And if you go back and look at the championship game in the second half, and I said it in the summer, guys, he made some mistakes. He made some mistakes. He put the ball in harm's way. He hadn't made a handful of mistakes all season. I mean, they're minor, and they're they're all part of the game, but – he doesn't make the same mistake twice on the same read. He, I no, I I did not expect. Um, I don't I don't think you you can ever anticipate them being this good. So uh, to have this type of an offense to go with uh, what they can do defensively, it's a uh, it's it's above my expectations, which were really high. I mean, I didn't think it would be this good. Chris, uh, do you think his skill set? transfers to the NFL yeah I want to I want to see his body develop I worry a little bit about his body and in, in the, the, the the physical makeup of the NFL is tough but let me tell you something a guy that can see the field and can throw it accurately to spots on time has got a place in the league regardless of height um, there, there's no question he's got a future at the next level there's no doubt about it that the instincts that we look for 
that, that I study so hard because they're the toughest thing. The physical skills are easy, but the intangible qualities are off the charts good. So he's got a chance. Again, I worry about him physically, um, you know, taking the pounding and whatnot. Uh, and that's going to be aided somewhat by the rules in the league where you, you don't hit him and all that. But that that's really the only thing. I, I think he's going to be outstanding. He'll have to learn, and he will learn, how to find the throwing lanes with his feet a little bit, um, like Drew Brees does. He's But those he this guy has the ability to learn and pick things up. And i got to tell you, um, I, I am impressed um, – with how he's picked things up, but the job that Dan Enos has done with him has been extraordinary. And he's really been a good coach, but you got you got a really good pupil here, and he's done a phenomenal job with him. His technique um, is he's just a, it, he's really his footwork is at times can get a little sloppy. He's just got the natural ability to kind of torque his body and and throw it accurately to spots that's just very hard well you really can't teach it you can improve accuracy with technique to some degree but for the most part the ability to throw accurately to spots is something you have or you don't have and he's got it in space we're talking to chris landry landryfootball.com yesterday and in switching to another topic that we've asked you about multiple times auburn's athletic director gave a vote of confidence for gus and expects that he will be back next year. I don't know what that means, uh, but as you look into this program that's probably going to win, you know, win seven football games, uh, go to a bowl, but really underperformed and, and did not exceed uh, any expectations. Uh, your thoughts on Gus and that program down on the Plains? Well, I think the announcement was getting ahead of the story because, you know, to the credit, it, it could have been even worse. They could have lost last week and and I think it would have been tough because I think they know what they're facing. I think that's that's the reason why they did it. And so as they go forward here, they're not going to beat Georgia. They're not going to beat Alabama. And so this is a way of saying, you know, um, yeah, we hear the noise, he's back. Okay, I mean, and, and they now have to go to work to try to fix it. But, um, you know, getting getting obviously to where they can go to a bowl, that's, that's not the expectation. But it is not disaster. I mean, there was a point where you could have made the case that this team was playing so poorly they could be three and six at this point. And, and that's where it becomes then they got to figure out how they're going to spend that money. I, I think they knew that it was going to be a tough look to go ahead and make the move this year. But, you know, Gus is, is going to have to make some really hard decisions um, about where he wants this offense to go going forward um i think his job is going to depend upon it next year um you know he's either going to just spit in the wind and say i, I i'm going to do it my way and if you want to buy me out i've had a lot of money owed to me after end of next year also or you know he's going to do the right thing and try to fix this offense and i think do something that he has been unwilling to do thus far uh when you have struggles uh, at, a, at a really high level um, sometimes it humbles you and makes you make decisions that you wouldn't have made so I'm very curious to see what they how they attack it this off season and to go about trying to fix this offense because it is definitely broken it's a personnel issue one but it's a coaching issue too big time we're talking to Chris Landry LandryFootball.com uh, Chris, uh, let me give you the flexibility to go anywhere you want to go. Is there a game that you're dialed in this week that might have some playoff implications, somebody that might be upset? You're looking at a matchup saying, hey, this might prevent somebody from doing it. Uh, look around college football. You can stay in the SEC, wherever yeah. you want to go. Just uh, grab a game and, and, well, and break it down. Well, listen, I, I, Clemson's playing really well. They're, they're playing uh, almost Alabama-like. They're going to play a Boston College team that would – remind you um, that thing, folks that don't watch him to give you a visual of maybe, you know, people in your audience that watch the SEC a lot, remind you a lot of Kentucky. They're physical on the offensive line, physical on the defensive line. They have a great running back. And so how does Clemson deal with it? Uh, I, I think they score points and they score them in a hurry and Boston College won't be able to keep up with the Clemson speed. But that's one to watch. 
It's going to be cold. My understanding, it's not going to be snowing or anything, but it's going to be cold at night in Chestnut Hill. Um, I, I give you, you know, something that's kind of interesting is what if Michigan State upsets Ohio State? And what if Ohio State upsets Michigan? Oh, wow. Yeah. Then, wow. then you're dealing with a Big 12, uh, excuse me, a Big 10 disaster, which would knock them out. And, and it's not inconceivable to happen. Um, Michigan State, we know what D'Antonio does. This is this is the team that is tough to run against, and Ohio State's not running the ball. Well, I think Ohio State will score some points through the air and, 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 and win the game. But that's something I want to watch because – Michigan's the better team. Michigan should beat Ohio State. But, you know, that is not as decisive as people might think. I want to see A&M. Uh, A&M is not playing well. Uh, different coach, but they're not finishing the season well. Taking care of business against Ole Miss is something I want to watch. Um, I want to watch Oklahoma uh, at home against uh, Oklahoma State in Bedlam. Uh, Oklahoma's defense is really struggling. I don't think that Oklahoma State's going to beat them on the road, but it's going to be interesting as well. Um, those kind of jump out of me. In Texas, Texas Tech is going to be a lot of fun. I know it doesn't have national championship implications, but um, one that I'm I'm going to be watching. It's not a great week, um, you know, in terms of intrigue. I gave you another one too. I'll stay in the SEC. This is getting, you know Kentucky. I know disappointing year. They haven't beaten Tennessee since 84 in Knoxville. You know, got to do it. Got to finish the season strong. You know, you got a chance to go 10-2. and two. That is uh, worthy of building a statue in Lexington from a football standpoint. And uh, Tennessee, you know, playing a little bit better and playing with more confidence, that has some intrigue for those reasons for me. But, but Chris, how many times is it that we get here to this month and we think we've all got it figured out and there's and some, something happens. And something happens and you go and that team put it on cruise control too early. They already yep. punched their ticket. And how many times in this game we see a we see an upset that we're not really seeing, uh, but it happens on Saturday. Well, and and it's usually these game it's usually this type of week too. That it is. It's not a uh, you know, it's this week and and it's gonna be you turn around and all of a sudden BC's taking Clemson to the fourth quarter. Or, you know, something's really happening, you know. You know, West Virginia's turned the ball over four times against TCU. And then, you know, that's that's a game. And something like that, you're right, it happens. But as they say, you know, if 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 I could predict it, it wouldn't be a surprise because, you know, I don't I don't see some of those things. I, I I am curious to see, not this week, because Notre Dame's got Florida State, and that is, speaking of disaster in Tallahassee, that's a big one. But um, look out for Notre Dame – going forward against Syracuse coming up, not this week. Uh, but that 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 is intriguing to me, and Notre Dame's not out of the woods yet, and neither is Michigan. Uh, I, I do think Alabama and Clemson will run the table, um, and this Clemson team looks like they're focused. And I think we see why uh, and understand why they made the move at the quarterback position to fix their problems. So I think, uh, I think it's going to be fun to watch. Chris, uh, the final thing, Mississippi State, Obviously, respected defense. I know you touched on them a couple of minutes ago. Is there any reason for us to believe that this one will be close? Well, listen, um, they've got a better defensive front than LSU. Their secondary is not better than LSU's, but it's good. This is a good challenge. Um, It's going to be good work for Alabama's offense. Um, But Alabama will score. They will score points. Likely, because of the environment and everything, they'll probably score 29, more than 29 points. Um, but, yeah, I think blocking these guys is going to be a challenge. I mean, I don't think, to be honest with you, um, as I think about this, other than a matchup against Clemson or Michigan, they won't face a defensive line as good as the one they're going to face at Mississippi State. The issue is going to be for Mississippi State is they can't score points. Um, and so they won't need to be a lot of points to win this game for Bama, but they will get a lot of points because here's what's going to happen. Mississippi State has to run the football. They won't be able to do it well enough. 
they'll get behind in the game, and then they'll have to abandon the run. And Nick Fitzgerald throwing the football, that's where you're going to see Alabama's defense start to take off again. There'll be some turnovers, and then it's going to be short fields for Alabama's offense, and it's going to be a little different in that regard because I I think that's how Alabama will, will end up kind of pulling away here. But just in terms of personnel, it's a pretty good group. A pretty good group. I mean, Errol Thomas Thompson is a really good linebacker. I mean, a lot of talk was about Devin White. Like this, this guy can really play, and Sweat is outstanding. Uh, Jeffrey Simmons. Uh, this is a really good group up front for Mississippi State. But I don't, I don't see this being um, all that close, quite frankly. Chris Landry, LandryFootball.com. It's something that's going to heat up this time of the month, that coaching search tracker. And we've certainly got a lot of candidates here. You know, Mike Loxley maybe mentioned uh, for a couple of jobs. He was the Frank Brawls uh, there on that assistant coach of the year. Uh, one of those nominations certainly will be a great candidate there. Uh, Dan Enos is getting some talks out in Kansas. Certainly you don't want to lose that guy when you've got a hot shot quarterback like Tua Tonga-Valoa here in Tuscaloosa. And that is going to be very, very busy. Spend a couple of minutes here talking about LandryFootball.com and give that big invitation that all these passionate college football fans need to hear. Well, it is getting to be a busy time of year because as we kind of wind down the last three or four weeks of the college season, yeah, we're breaking down the games, but we're having to parse our time a little bit with a lot of the coaching search work. Before we put the, the SEC championship to bed, it'll be signing day. So we're, we're going in a lot of different directions. Of course, we've got the NFL covered as well. So that's what we do. We take you inside the film room, give you the inside information, give you the analysis from a coaching and scouting perspective using certainly myself and other scouts around the NFL, other coaches around the college game. So that's what we do for you. If it involves players, teams, coaches, schemes at the college or NFL level, that's what we provide for you. And uh, so check us out at LandryFootball.com. You won't be disappointed. You can follow us on Twitter at LandryFootball. Uh, right now, working on wrapping up the Mississippi State-Alabama preview. So we're going to go in depth, got some written stuff, but also we're going to provide a little or doing some things a little different, a little bit variety as well to kind of provide an oral presentation within depth uh, about the, each of these matchups. So um, get, follow our podcast every Tuesday and Thursday. Got a special college football podcast on Wednesday, as you mentioned, Ryan. So uh, we really uh, enjoy what we're doing here, and uh, we always want your feedback there as fans to, to other things we can do better to, um, to, to make it more enjoyable for you. So LandryFootball.com, check it out. We know you'll love it. He's a veteran scout and a coach and administrator. Uh, go check it out, LandryFootball.com. Chris, I appreciate you, and I hope you have a great week and a great weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it, bud.